Okay, our next speaker is Minister Shane Bradbury. Now, Minister Bradbury is speaking today in his role as Minister for TANS, which includes the responsibility of the animal welfare as well. He's currently also the Minister for Justice, Minister for Sport and Recreation, and the Minister assisting the Chief Minister on Transport Reform. Shane studied economics and law at the Australian National University, and after graduating, Shane worked for 10 years at Greenpeace in roles that included campaign director at Greenpeace South East Asia in Bangkok and head of the Oceans Unit at Greenpeace International in Amsterdam. In this last role, he led an expedition to the Southern Ocean to take on the Japanese whaling fleet and seek an end to the whale hunt. Good on him. So please welcome Minister Shane Bradbury. Thank you for that, welcome and good evening everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to first to begin by going to we come together tonight on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, uh, the traditional custodians of this area, and I acknowledge their long and continuing connection to the country we now call Canberra. I'd like to congratulate the RSPCA on 60 years of support for animals in the ACT. And I think from the humble beginnings of 23 people in 1955, uh, this is truly a story of from little things, big things grow. And so I'd particularly like to thank Louise as the President and Tammy as the CEO and all the other RSPCA staff for putting this event together tonight to celebrate 60 years of outstanding achievement. When you think about how much things have changed in animal welfare over the last 60 years, it does seem a little daunting to try and forecast what might happen over the next 60 years. And I'm not sure if I'm bold enough to fully predict it, but I've got a few ideas. But if you think about it, in the last 20 years and the time that the ACT Greens have been represented in the Legislative Assembly, so much has changed. Uh, certainly we've had animal welfare high on our priorities. But the ACT is now one of the best jurisdictions in Australia when it comes to animal welfare. I must take issue with you there slightly, Wendy. I think we're doing pretty well compared to a lot of other places. We don't have animals in circuses. We don't let people dock dogs' tails. We don't let people put spurs on cocks for fighting. We don't let companies produce eggs with hens in tiny cages. We don't force sows into stalls. And as of last week, we banned puppy and kitten farms here in the ACT. I was reminded as well by Jane, of course, of the ban on fireworks. Perhaps not seen directly as an animal welfare issue, but very much driven by that. I was there for the boat, and I can tell you that animal welfare was the key consideration in banning fireworks. It wasn't about being the fun police, I can assure you. <laughs> It is interesting to reflect on changes in attitudes just across these last 20 years. When we first put forward legislation to ban the sale of puppies in pet stores, the opposition said we were trying to ban the sale of puppies in a sort of pretty unfriendly, anti-family kind of way. When we, banned, when we banned sow stalls, the opposition said we were wasting time because there weren't any in the ACT and we were therefore failing to recognise the significance of the ACT being the first jurisdiction in Australia to set a new standard and hopefully drive change nationally. And it took seven bills, seven attempts over more than 15 years to ban battery hen farms in the ACT. But that just shows you that persistence does finally pay off. It is through the work of the RSPCA and other animal welfare organisations that the public are exposed to some of the most horrific practices involving animals, be it puppy farms, greyhound racing or animal abuse of the various forms that it come in, comes in. And I think this, is, this exposure has largely contributed to the shift in public attitudes towards animal welfare and resulted in changes in the position of our legislators. Social media has played an important role and you certainly can't these days as a politician say you're not exposed to issues of animal abuse uh, and feel ignorant of it. Uh, people can no longer pretend that it's not happening when things go viral and make it very clear what is happening out there in the world. Now we've seen the federal government propose the ag gag laws uh, and I think that's very much heading in the wrong direction in trying to silence those attempting to expose animal welfare issues. Amongst all those portfolios I'm also the ACT's Minister for Primary Industries and at the National Forum I've opposed those ag gag laws. Probably it's a little bit of the activist in me as well but I know that we need to be advocating for the people who are trying to expose the problem, not trying to clamp down on them. And we need those things brought to public attention so that we can change them. So whilst we've come a long way in the last 20 years, in the last 60 years, there is still a lot more to do. 
And for me, the biggest thing that will drive change is a change in attitude where animals are no longer seen simply as a tool or as a commodity, but instead are universally recognised as sentient beings that deserve our care and respect. Now let me try and cast forward, and I'm going to do this in two ways. The next five years, and I think there's some very concrete things that will happen in the next five years, and then I'm going to attempt to go to 60 years out. There's some simple things like allowing pets on buses, making it easier for people with pets to get around the city, and making Canberra generally more animal friendly. Now we've seen that shift in Europe and the United States over the past decade or so, as animals are much more widely accepted in the public domain at cafes and restaurants, on public transport, even at the movies. Pets are increasingly becoming more integrated into daily family life. And it's only reasonable to expect that we will need to change our level of acceptance of animals in the community in line with this. I'd like to see a return to full labelling of all cosmetics items on retail shelves similar to the egg labelling laws we have here in the ACT. The 80s and early 90s saw a big movement against animal testing. Cosmetic products proudly wore their cruelty-free logos and companies that tested animals were publicly shamed. Somewhere along the way, the momentum behind this campaign has waned and the cruelty-free logo is no longer so widely seen. We need to ensure consumers have enough information to make informed choices when purchasing cosmetic products. A simple way to do this would be to introduce mandatory shelf labelling laws, similar to what we've done here in the ACT with egg labelling. I'm sure you've noticed in the supermarket you now go along and there's the ones with the free, free range and there's the cage ones. And who would buy the cage ones always looks like they're sheepish. <laughs> <laughs> I think shops should be forced to categorise products based on whether or not they were tested on animals. The use of animals in, in medical assistance and, or therapy, engagement with detainees in our jails and the elderly is also an area we've seen developed internationally and I think saying we've got a long way to go here in the ACT. It's been touched on already, but I think we need better education in schools on how to interact with animals, especially with dogs, but how to respect animals, and how to make more informed, sustainable food choices. And I'll come back to animals and food, but our children need to know where food comes from. This goes very much to what Penny was talking about, because too many people just sort of, they see it in a packet on the shelf in the supermarket and they have no concept of what it means for that piece of meat or that animal product to end up there. And that's what allows cruel animal practices in food production to go on. At a very practical level, we need to allow our greyhound owners to have green collar approvals for their dogs from other jurisdictions recognised here in the ACT. We need to stop live animals being used for experimentation and training purposes. It does happen here in the Territory. And we've got some work to do to bring it into that. Now, some of the advances we've made here in the ACT will be copied in other jurisdictions. I am very pleased as we make progress on some of these issues here in the Territory, that the ideas are spreading around the country and hopefully we've created the template that other jurisdictions might copy. I think technology will play a massive role over the coming years, it already is, but that will continue to expand. Instead of trying to stop members of the public from accessing private farms and places where animals are kept, Primary producers and other organisations should embrace the use of technology and social media to demonstrate their commitment to ethical behaviour. <clears throat> We've already seen this with free range egg farms now having a live web stream of their operations for the public to see because they are proud of the way their hens are able to live. And this should become the norm, whereby legitimate companies who are doing the right thing have nothing to hide. Instead of attempting to silence people who expose those who do the wrong thing, we should be promoting those who are doing the right thing. And I welcome Penny's comments about farm transparency and inviting people to come onto the farm rather than trying to lock them out of the gate. Uh, technology, technological advantages such as webcams, drones, GPS, all of these things will make it even easier to monitor, manage and share information about the welfare of animals over time. Uh, for example, we could even use webcams and drones for inspections of remote farms more regularly. In a slightly more obscure category, we need to work towards bee security. For the future of our own food security, we need to ensure that we are planting the right species across our cities and our open spaces with the right mixes to make sure that we don't have colony collapse of our critically important bees colonies. 
And we need to have a national animal welfare authority with improved capacity to respond to animal welfare issues, including better response to the live export of animals. Doing it on a state-by-state -state basis is not good enough. This is an area where we need national standards, and it should be the same standard across the country. It should, of course, be a high standard. Let me look to the longer term. I imagine that in 60 years, things will be ready from the world generally. I just can't imagine what life is going to be like. I hope to make it that far. I'd love to see what it's going to be like. But it is hard to imagine what life will be like in 2075. But I'm going to make a few bold predictions. And also let me know on some of the things I wonder about and don't have the answers for. I'm sure cat containment will be a way of life in Canberra. And we'll have done that to make sure we protect our native species. There will have been an end to greyhound and horse racing, including the jumps. The public is gradually coming to realise the impact that these so-called sports have on the animals involved, with the highly publicised deaths of two horses in the 2014 Melbourne Cup and the ongoing campaign to expose the use of live baby in greyhound racing. It can only be a matter of time until these activities are ceased, and I certainly think it will have been done by 2075. Wildlife underpasses under, all our, under or over all of our highways will be the norm, and we'll have fully connected wildlife corridors as we realise that as, even here in Canberra we've got our tremendous network of nature reserves. We know that we are marooning some of those animals in those spaces and they need more freedom to move. Uh, I think that's becoming more well understood internationally. Now we're going to get more controversial and talk about the ending of ugly species discrimination. <laughs> and I can talk about this because I used to work on oceans issues for Greenpeace and did a lot of work on deep sea environments. And I can tell you there's some really ugly critters <laughs> live a thousand metres below the ocean surface. Or at least we think of them as ugly. But they're in fact incredible species uh, that are highly adapted and frankly fabulous. But we need to develop a greater public understanding of the importance of the ecological balance and protect things like lizards, frogs, bees and bugs. And not just the charismatic creatures which get so much of the publicity. We of course have our issues with kangaroo management here in the ACT and I could probably talk about that for a long time, but uh, we will need to have a broader understanding of protecting all of the critters. I wonder what impact climate change will have on animals? What will animals have on a dry world? What types of companion animals will people have? What about native animals in the domestic environment? And I'm running out of time, but I wanted to wonder what will happen in terms of genetic manipulation of animals. I fear in a world where we have the right to choose the colour, shape and size of everything that we buy, or at least we think we should have, uh, what are people going to do to create the pets that they think they might want? We have a long way to go. Things change slowly, but I think we're making a lot of progress. I think a lot more will happen in the coming 60 years. Thank you very much.